Good morning and welcome to this, the 19th meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee of 2018. Can I make the usual uh, request that electronic devices are on airplane mode and mobile phones are off the tables, please? Agenda item one is continuation of our Human Rights and the Scottish Parliament inquiry. And the first item this morning is an oral evidence session with Gianni Magazzeni, the Chief of the UPR Branch Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the United Nations, and Rogier Huzenga, who is the manager of the Human Rights Programme Interparliamentary Union, and we are linking up via video conference from Geneva. So before I begin, can I just check that Gianni and Rogier can hear us OK? Yes, yes. it's OK. Wonderful. Um, I believe that you both have an opening statement to make. So, um, Gianni, do you want to go first? Thank you very much, uh, convener and distinguished members of this committee. We were very pleased to provide evidence to you this morning. Um, of course, our remarks will be very much of a general nature, outlining how the Secretary General, the High Commissioner and the Human Rights Council see the relationship between parliaments and human rights. And I would like to start by referring to a report which the Secretary General issued last year uh, to the General Assembly, where he actually stated, and I quote, at the national level, parliaments play a crucial role in the promotion and protection of human rights as legislators and as overseers. They lay the foundation for the rule of law and the respect for and protection of human rights. He also went on in the same report stating, and I quote, parliaments can ensure transparency and accountabilities for states' human rights obligation and in following up and ensuring the implementation of recommendations by both regional and international human rights mechanisms. And he pointed out that, and I quote, while human rights are a cross-cutting issue that should be taken into account by all parliamentary committees, the establishment of a parliamentary committee with an exclusive human rights mandate sends a strong political message and should be encouraged. The Secretary General in that same report also recommended uh, the development by the international community of international principle that could guide even more the strengthening of this engagement between parliaments and the human rights mechanism. Now, I would like to say very briefly that over the past years, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the IPU have worked very closely in connection with a number of Human Rights Council endeavour uh, that had to do with strengthening the engagement of parliaments with human rights. The most recent of which, of course, was resolution of the Council of last year, 35-29, which basically called for, among other things, a study on strengthening the engagement of parliaments with the Human Rights Council and its universal periodic review mechanism. Uh, we have shared the report with you. Uh, the report was issued just a few days ago, and it will be considered during the current session of the Human Rights Council 38. Um, I would like just to emphasize at this very beginning that uh, why is this so relevant, this connection of parliaments with the Human Rights Council and especially the UPR? Because, of course, uh, when we consider the Universal Periodic Review, it is entering the third cycle, which started actually on 1st May 2017. This third cycle, it's focused on implementation of recommendation. And in this effort to ensure greater implementation by all stakeholders, the role of Parliament is critical. The report I already mentioned of the Secretary General of last year referred to the fact that over 50% of recommendations from the Universal Periodic Review in order to be implemented require some kind of action by parliaments. And so it is critically important that they are involved in all phases of the Universal Periodic Review, both the preparation of the national report, the review in Geneva in the Human Rights Council, and more importantly, follow-up action at country level in connection with the implementation of recommendations. 
Now, one thing I would like also to flag at the beginning is that uh, the report uh, presented to the Human Rights Council contains draft principles on parliaments and human rights. Those principles clearly encourage the establishment of human rights committees within parliaments and also provide element for the terms of reference, the transparency, the composition, the working methods of those committees, which we hope will be an encouragement for parliaments that do not yet have a dedicated committee that deals with the oversight function with respect to the government's responsibility for the promotion and protection of human rights in line with the legal obligations resulting from the ratification of international human rights treaties or the political commitments that they make when they interact with the international human rights mechanism, especially the Universal Periodic Review. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Gianni. I think this is the first time a parliamentary committee of this parliament has engaged so directly with the UN, so we're really grateful to have you with us this morning and to hear um, some of the details on the draft principles. Rogier, I, I, I wonder if you've got anything to add to Gianni's opening statement? Um, yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you as well very much for, uh, for inviting the IPU to be part of uh, this exercise. And uh, we're very pleased as well to engage with your committee because we know that your committee has shown, uh, it has been at the forefront of promoting human rights. And actually, we are aware of, of, of several good practices that your committee has shown. And, and I think we, we think as well can inspire other committees around the world um, to better promote and protect human rights. I just wanted to mention very briefly eight points um, around the work of parliamentary committees in relation to the work that the IPU has been doing, in the hope as well that this is particularly relevant to your committee. Um, first of all, the committee, the parliamentary human rights committee model. I understand that two years ago your committee um, decided, or it was decided that your committee included human rights within its remit, and, 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 and there is both equality in human rights as part of, um, of your um, a general um, a remit now. Um, the IPU has always been a strong advocate of having dedicated parliamentary human rights committees. But at the same time, we've also highlighted the importance of making sure that these committees do not work in isolation from other committees, but really closely coordinate and cooperate with these other committees. Because also, in some cases, we have seen, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that this is not at all saying that this is the case in Scotland, quite the contrary, but uh, in some cases, we've seen that these committees have been set up just to pay lip service to human rights. And um, if there is no real willingness and commitment uh, within Parliament as a whole, then that body will not be terribly effective. So that's the first point. Second point, the importance of setting out clear objectives for each of these parliamentary human, uh, human rights committees and to establish a work plan for the full parliamentary term. Third, um, the importance of strong committee involvement in UN monitoring uh, mechanisms. As Johnny has just said, I think there is a, a real favorable disposition and momentum in the UN right now to engage with parliaments. And I think it's important that Parliament seize that opportunity when it comes to the Universal Periodic Review, but also the work of the UN treaty bodies by making sure that they are aware, that they put it on the agenda, that they are aware that the national report is going to be uh, prepared, that they discuss that report with the relevant ministries, officials, that they see whether it's possible that they can be included in national delegations to these UN mechanisms and may, maybe most importantly that they are aware of the recommendations and concluding observations that come out of these mechanisms and that they also question the relevant authorities about uh, implementation. Uh, fourth point, uh, the importance of working as much as possible uh, and drawing on the expertise of your National Human Rights Commission. Uh, we did a survey um, not so long ago um, which looked at the implementation of the Belgrade Principles on the relationship and cooperation between parliaments and uh, national human rights institutions. And what came out very clearly is that national human rights institutions do present reports regularly to parliaments, but when it comes to the feedback and the follow-up that uh, comes out of those presentations, there is a lot to be desired. Uh, to give you just... Uh, uh, one, one, one figure, 
only in 25% of the cases do parliaments take follow-up actions when an HRI report are presented. And most of these actions are then also subsequently not, commit, not conveyed or communicated to the National Human Rights Institution. Um, point number five. Make effective oversight of government action a priority by addressing challenges to such oversight. And this is maybe relevant not just to your committee, but to all parliamentary communities. Um, and maybe uh, this is a suggestion from the IPU to also see if you can draw on best practices that are listed in the IPU UNDP Global Parliamentary Report, which was launched uh, last year. Um, it's a report which deals exclusively with the issue of parliamentary oversight and it has produced quite a number of recommendations that are useful across the board in Parliament. Point number six, the importance of not only reviewing compliance of draft legislation with human rights before that legislation is adopted, but also do an ex post human rights impact assessment of implementation of that legislation and make it very clear that this is included um, when bills um, are adopted to make sure that within two, three or five year, years there's an automatic review uh, of um, the respect for human rights. Um, obviously, not just the European Convention of Human Rights, we're aware that, that this is how uh, the Human Rights Act is, 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 is formulated, but ideally as well with regard to the UN um, um, monitoring uh, bodies. Seven, the importance of parliaments taking the lead in promoting national uh, debate around human rights issues. I think this is something that the IPU has seen time and time again, that it's important to not leave human rights to experts alone. Uh, human rights often require tough political choices that need to be made, um, and it's important that Parliament seize on the opportunity to offer the platform, offer this public national platform to, 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 to initiate this debate together with the audience at large, with the National Human Rights Commission, civil society organizations and academia, and also to go to citizens and to, to, to be on the move as much as possible. And last point, the importance of monitoring the impact of your committee's work, both in terms of processes and substantive results. Where has your committee been able to make a difference? Um, obviously, this is not only useful for your own citizens, but also for us, because we are trying to collect as much as possible as well examples uh, globally uh, of where we can show very clearly that parliaments were not, on, their involvement was not only important from a purely procedural perspective, but also because at the end of the day, they were able to deliver better on human rights as a whole. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. They're excellent points and, and we're already working on a number of them, so we feel as if we're on the right track. So uh, I'm going to go to opening questions this morning from uh, my committee colleagues uh, opening with the first question, Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning and thank you for joining us today. It really is a great honour to be able to speak to you and also to get feedback on our committee and what we're doing well and, and what we could do better and also as a Scottish Parliament. You spoke um, about, Roger, about the national debate that we have to have now and including members of society as well as members of parliament. So how can we as a Scottish parliament empower our society to make people more aware of their rights, both under um, domestic and international human rights law and to help to build a strong culture of human rights here in Scotland? Um, what, what we have seen in, uh, in, in, in several situations is that parliaments, as I mentioned, they try to be on the move as much as possible, be as close to citizens as, as much as possible, so not just, um, not just in the capital, so to speak, but also to meet with uh, citizens because of, obviously their concerns can be different depending on the region that they live and the, 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 the part of town that they live in, um, so that the parliament is also seen to be reaching out as much as possible. I think that's already a very important symbolic step. Also because with that you may get other kind of feedback than you would normally get by sitting where you normally sit. Um, uh, secondly, uh, what we see is very important is that the audience, that the public sees that this is a by this is done in a bipartisan spirit. Uh, I think it's important for, for the public to see that all parliaments can rally around human rights issues. Um, and I think, uh, thirdly, um, 
what we have also seen parliamentarians do uh, is uh, also to, 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 to use their work as, um, as an opportunity to have uh, not just hearings again in, in the capital, but also uh, in the country around specific human rights themes uh, by, by being this, this, uh, this catalyzer for bringing people together uh, and also with the mandate to do so. Uh, and I think that in itself around specific human rights topics that are very urgent within uh, your, your, your given context, uh, I think that is very useful. And lastly, um, some parliaments as well, uh, members of parliament, they work a lot with schools, uh, including themselves, and they actually they go to schools uh, and talk about human rights as much as possible because um, this is something that is incredibly appreciated by schools and, and, and of course, uh, well, subsequently as well, this is sh shown in the media as well as, as, as being a, a, a particular step that parliamentarians are seen to be taken. And I think it's important for the public as large as well to see this happening. But I think also practically speaking, it, it, gives, a, it gives a very strong signal that, that MPs individually and as a committee as a whole are engaged. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Mary Fee. Thank you, um, convener, and good morning. Um, my question follows on from the question that's just been posed by my colleague Gail Ross. How can we as, as parliamentarians ensure that the duty bearers, those responsible for human rights, absolutely and fundamentally know what those rights and duties are and how they should be carried out? Well, let me say that uh, I mentioned earlier that this third cycle of the UPR is focused on implementation. And as part of this stronger focus on implementation on the part of the entire UN system, not just the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, we encourage a number of steps to be considered at national level. One of them is the creation of national mechanism for coordination and follow-up of all the requirements under international human rights treaties which includes treaty bodies' recommendations and, as well, the recommendations from the Universal Periodic Review. Um, I have to say that worldwide we have seen progress on this issue in at least 50 countries, and we are certainly engaged to support the strengthening or the reinforcing of such mechanism of coordination. They are led by the executive, clearly, very often is the ministry, Minister of Justice, and or foreign affairs. But one of the points I would like to emphasize here, we have always reiterated among the good practices the involvement of uh, parliaments in these bodies, both because, as we said earlier, they play a key role in implementation with respect to more than 50% of recommendations from the Universal Periodic Review, uh, action that may require legislative reform, or other form of steps that require the parliament to be directly involved, but also because of the oversight function vis-a-vis -vis government's responsibility on policies and action. Now, the recommendations from the UPR, and I said the third cycle is focused on implementation, is not ending here. Uh, countries that have gone through the third cycle uh, already will come back in 2021 or 2022 and again, the focus will be what has been done vis-à-vis -vis recommendation that the country has received, especially those that have been accepted. And I think that uh, the importance for uh, the mechanism and this universal periodic review of parliamentary awareness of this recommendation and the position taken by the concerned member states is fundamental for any plan of action from today to the next four and a half years and for being part of the implementation. So I think, again, as the Secretary General was saying in his report, the role of Parliament is crucial. And if we see more of these efforts at implementation, we will see tremendous benefit on other two fronts. The prevention agenda, addressing root causes, reducing also what produced and cause IDPs, max exoduses, refugees. And let me just say that yesterday was uh, Refugee Day, and we have heard from our colleagues in UNHCR that we are at 68.5 million 
uh, today, which is the highest number since World War II. And second point, the more we focus on the implementation of recommendations from the human rights mechanism, the more we will contribute to the success and sustainability of the Agenda 2030 and the SDGs. Thank, thank you for that. Um, in, in our evidence sessions, one of the, um, the, the people that gave us evidence suggested that the introduction of human rights officers in, in public bodies would be an important step forward. Would you agree with that? Well, I think that uh, I'm not sure I'm in a position to answer that question. I would say that uh, what we are here emphasizing is for all parliaments to have a strong focus on human rights and have a parliamentary committee that deals with that, not just the foreign policy aspect, not only the situation in other countries, which is tremendously important, especially for ODA and development assistance, but also because of their role of oversight vis-à-vis -vis the legal obligations and the political commitments made by the state concerned. I would say that that, in my view, it's already a very important step ahead in many jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you. Fulton. Thanks very much um, for joining us this morning. Um, a lot of the uh, people that have given us evidence have raised concerns about Brexit and that it might weaken uh, Scotland and indeed the UK's uh, human rights protections. Have you any thoughts on that and how this parliament can possibly seek to protect that um, going forward through the Brexit process? Well, I'm not sure I'm in a position to comment on that. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, this goes beyond my responsibilities. And I reiterate that uh, for us, uh, one of the most important objectives of this hearing is to encourage greater action and knowledge of the international human rights obligation and recommendations made to member states so that follow-up action can be taken and that, in our view, can only contribute to advancing in the promotion and protection of human rights, strengthening resilience of society, and, as I mentioned earlier, have an important contribution also to development and peace and security. Okay. And if I may, um, maybe also to add uh, that, um, of course, there's Brexit and there, there is the, um, the relationship as well with uh, the European Convention uh, on Human Rights. But I think this is also an important opportunity to highlight precisely uh, the, um, the importance of the, uh, of the UN uh, human rights treaties and the UN human rights mechanisms. Um, because the focus, I think, has been very much uh, on the European Convention on Human Rights uh, in the UK uh, context, uh, which is, of course, understandable and welcome. Um, but I think in this, this time of uncertainty um, as to where things will go with the Human Rights Act, I think it's also all the wise to make sure that the work of these UN human rights treaties and monitoring bodies are, is, is, is fully included as a reference in your work. Over. Uh, thank you, Convener. Can I just start with a brief follow-up to that question? I just wondered um, if you were able to comment on the fact that there are a large number of countries that exist uh, outside the EU that do have uh, good human rights practice. Well, uh, I think that uh, we encourage not only good practices, but also we try to share those good models so that... Uh, countries that are undertaking their obligation, that are following up on recommendations, especially those that they've accepted and that strengthen the national protection system, which for us means a variety of things, including a strong and independent judiciary, a parliament with a human rights committee, national institutions in line with the Paris principle, space for civil society, human rights defenders to do their investigative work, I think that uh, certainly there are good examples in the European context, and we encourage those good examples, as well as those in other contexts. Again, for us, the most important thing is to make this uh, 
cycle of the UPR, the third cycle, focus on an implementation agenda. And we're looking very much forward to greater engagement on the, par on the part of Parliament at national level, because in our view, especially those that have already a human rights committee and that already play an oversight role vis-à-vis -vis those international obligations with respect to human rights action and policies, uh, that those examples are well known and potentially followed by other countries. So we certainly encourage those good practices and we will be having actually a discussion at the IPU and in the Human Rights Council a week from today in order exactly to share a few of those good practices so that uh, member states, representative of the governments, but as well as uh, other important stakeholders can take stock of those positive developments, learn from them, and hopefully see from our part more and more of an engagement on the part of parliaments at the national level, at the regional level, and at the international level. Thank you uh, for that answer. I just wondered round, uh, when you talk about the national and regional level, uh, thinking within the, the UK context, obviously the United Kingdom uh, is the member state and uh, most of the, the, the sort of treaty uh, obligations are certainly the treaty signing process uh, rests at a UK level. Uh, how, how do you see the, the interaction between uh, devolved parliaments like ours and uh, national parliaments uh, like uh, the, the UK Parliament in this context? Well, I'm not sure I'm in a position to comment on that. Again, those are internal distribution and, and devolution of powers and responsibilities. But again, for us, the critical issue is to have and see more engagement on the part of parliaments, especially if we want to see progress on this implementation agenda as part of the third cycle, if we want to see more results that uh, improves the human rights situation at country level, especially for vulnerable groups and other affected minorities, I think that we need to see greater knowledge, greater involvement, and greater oversight role on the part of Parliament. And this is what we hope very much to contribute with this endeavour here today and with others that we hope will follow this hearing. Roger, yeah. Uh, maybe if I can, if I can just add that um, you know what we see as well when it comes to good practices is that uh, in some ways Europe is in the lead, uh, and that's maybe not a surprise. But in other ways, it isn't necessarily. I mean, um, what we see, have seen with a number of parliaments in Western Europe is that, well, first of all, they don't have a dedicated parliamentary human rights committee. Um, and sometimes the argument is simply that human rights is not an issue here in our country. Uh, sometimes we're told this quite straightforwardly. Uh, human rights is a concern outside, our, outside of our borders. So there is no real need to talk about human rights within, within our country. Um, and this has sometimes also allowed other countries and other regions to be much more advanced in dealing with human rights issues. Um, to give you one example, um, uh, that of Mexico... Uh, the Mexico has uh, two chambers, uh, the upper chamber uh, and the lower chamber have both have a, a human rights committee and the Senate has a, uh, a parliamentary human rights committee. Um, and this committee has been involved from start to finish in several of the uh, universal periodic reviews of uh, Mexico's human rights record by the UN Human Rights Council. The president of that committee uh, was in the lead in preparing part of the report uh, that was submitted to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Human Rights Council. The president of the committee was also part of the official delegation of Mexico that came to Geneva and actually spoke and addressed the UN Human Rights Council to give the parliament's perspective on uh, the human rights situation in Mexico. And then also took the recommendations forward by, by questioning the ministers on their return to Mexico about how they are, were going to implement these recommendations. So I think there are quite a number of very good examples, um, including outside of Europe, of where parliaments have been taking these, these steps to make sure that they're fully in the picture, but also fully in the lead as much as possible in helping ensure implementation of human rights. My final question was just around local delivery. Obviously, 
uh, this Parliament has quite a proud record of debating human rights issues, talking about them. We've established this committee um, and we're already actioning many of the, the points you've identified. But how do, how, how do we move, uh, it's similar to questions already been asked, but how do we move that uh, forward into to local delivery, particularly at local authority level, at municipal level, uh, where many of the services are actually being delivered? How do we as a parliament ensure that human rights, uh, there's a human rights focus when services are actually being delivered? Um, a difficult question. Um, I, I mean, I think it's in a way related to the question that was asked previously before about having human rights officers in public bodies. Um, I think the Im importance here is to, to make sure that um, all state structures um, are sensitive to human rights. Now, I don't know if having a dedicated uh, a public officer within each of these bodies uh, focused specific specifically on human rights is the answer. But I think some of the recommendations and observations that I started off with, uh, which I hoped would somehow be relevant, and I understand them to be for your committee, I think they're also relevant in, in maybe different ways um, for, um, for, for other bodies in Scotland. You know, making sure that you reach out as much as possible to committees, uh, establishing clear objectives and a work plan, uh, be as close to citizens as possible. I think all of these... Uh, are, are valid points, uh, not just for your work, but also for other entities within the uh, Scottish context that work on human rights. And I think it's up to them and you to define what this means in practice. Is there any and good... Sorry. Uh, sorry, I was going to ask, are there any good international examples of, of where that's already taking place? Well, I mean, um, I think the examples, I, I, I gave examples of, um, um, you know, parliamentarians reaching out to citizens um, by holding public meetings um, in town halls uh, together with uh, civil society organizations, uh, going to schools, uh, carrying out bipartisan visits to regions where there, where, where there are particular tensions. Um, there are a number of suggestions that we, uh, that, that we have seen parliaments take on. Yep. Moving on, yeah. Annie. Thank you, convener, and good morning, and thank you very much for joining us today. My question is around the balance of human rights and how do we, as a, as a parliament, achieve the, the correct balance of human rights, especially when there's lots of competing human rights and interests, especially when it comes to new legislation. So how do we achieve that? Roger, you want to go ahead? Um, I think it's a critical question, um, and I think that's also where... It's very important that, and I, and I think with that I also want to come back to my first observation, which is about making sure that your work is fully connected to the work of the other committees. Um, because uh, if at the end of the day everyone sees that human rights is just your responsibility, uh, then this, it, it, will be, it can be easily presented as, well, once you have been heard of or have been somehow involved in the discussion, that's the end of it. But I think it's important for your committee to make sure that human rights at the end of the day is a responsibility for the whole parliament, even though you take the lead. Uh, I think it starts with that. Now, of course, at the end of the day, um, uh, there's only so much you can do. Um, yes, there's the Human Rights Act. Um, yes, uh, there are the clear obligations that uh, the UK has. Um, uh, when it comes to human rights. Uh, and you have the procedures and mechanisms in place to make sure that uh, the state as a whole uh, can be held uh, to account. Uh, and I think that's, at the end of the day, uh, your role. Now, uh, and these obligations remain, regardless of whether uh, ministers come and go and whether they focus more on trade um, or, or, or other issues. I think, at the end of the day, uh, these obligations have to be always put up front um, and make sure that in the, in the back of everyone's minds, these obligations will not go away, these recommendations will not go away, regardless of uh, a stronger focus on, um, on trade or other issues. And I think it's ultimately the duty of Parliament to make sure 
that um, that these obligations are, are are respected. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Alec Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, good morning to our guests by video conference. Apologies for my late arrival. Um, I'd like to address, uh, Roger, in your reflections, you talked about our inquiry into making rights real in the Parliament and made several suggestions and observations that was very helpful. Um, I think one of the things we've been focused on is how we ensure that you know, our focus on human rights in this inquiry continues into the long term. You know, We're all very excited, very committed to human rights and, and drawing that thread through all all the work of this parliament but we are all politicians and we have um, sadly limited job security in this and we may not all be here in the next parliamentary session in that vein um, in thinking about institutional memory we've been talking about the need perhaps to have staff within the parliament who can be the guarantors of that institutional memory legal advisors even um, what are your reflections on that and, and how important do you think that is to continue that work I, I think it's, uh, it's a, an absolutely critical point, and, and, and we see this in, uh, in many parliaments around the world. As you say, uh, parliamentarians come and go, uh, and uh, most often uh, it's parliamentary staff that has much more, well, I don't know if it's necessarily job security, but it's much more likely that parliamentary staff will stay around for much longer and that they, that they, that they have this institutional memory. Um, so, which is also why, as an organisation, as, as, as the Interparliamentary Union, we work both with parliamentarians, with parliaments, MPs, but also with parliamentary staff, precisely for that reason. Uh, and we think it's absolutely critical to engage with them because they are the institutional memory, quite often, of the of, of the organisation. Uh, and it also means that. Uh, they need to have the requisite training to be helpful to the committees that they serve. So, yes, it's absolutely critical that you can rely on expertise, that you have expert uh, legal advice uh, that you can draw on for your inquiries. Uh, it's also absolutely critical that you can uh, rely on uh, research facilities uh, to be able to uh, put your questions together that you want to ask from the relevant authorities, but also in organizing your inquiries. So yes, both expert legal staff is um, indispensable. Uh, and this is also, this is something that we've been pushing for everywhere around the world. And also the availability of, uh, of research facilities. Helpful, and it certainly chimes with our, um, I think, shared view that's emerging across the committee. Can I also uh, touch on something that you raised in your points, and I think a number of members have uh, touched on this as well. It's around the idea of a specific human rights committee. This isn't just a human rights committee. This is a human rights and equalities committee. For example, we spent uh, much of this last year looking at a, a gender representation on public boards bill, which is not a human rights issue, but it is an equalities issue. So um, can I just ask whether you you think we need to disaggregate those two functions so that we have a specific committee within the Scottish Parliament solely focused on uh, human rights guarantee? Um, I think ultimately it's, it's, it's obviously it's your call uh, to make. Uh, we have always been strong advocates of having a of, of having a, a dedicated parliamentary human rights community. We know that in reality Many committees around the world in parliaments have both human rights and uh, something else in their remit. Uh, and this can be, uh, we see a variety of situations. You have uh, equality and human rights. Others may have uh, national minorities, depending a little bit on the context and often the history. Uh, as I understand, you, your committee started as an equal opportunities committee. Um, I think at the end of the day, you have to make your own, uh, you have to draw your own conclusions as to whether you are sufficiently effective or not in promoting a human rights agenda. Uh, if you think that um, the other issues are taking too much of focus away and not allowing you to come out with a coherent message on human rights, then maybe it is useful to separate the two. Um, then still it being understood that a human rights committee with just exclusively a human rights mandate is powerful and effective enough to also relay its message internally within Parliament. Thank you. Um, 
One more question, if I may, Camilla. Um, on that, in terms of uh, where, where we sort of put the focus of the work of this committee, when we first grappled with the human rights remit that we, we had taken on at the start of this session, we looked, uh, I think, you know, with fresh eyes, really, at the fact that there are some 900 concluding observations of points where the United Kingdom and, indeed, Scotland are still out of step or adrift of our international human rights treaties obligations. That is a quite a daunting exercise in terms of uh, establishing where do you start um, and, uh, you know, how do you eat a whale one bite at a time. But how, w how would you advise us, this committee, and our successor committees, um, as an approach to addressing, you know, those outstanding areas of Scottish life where we are still adrift of international treaty obligations, and still manage that as a workable uh, work programme. Well, if I may say, there are, of course, uh, many contexts in which the numbers of recommendations is daunting and uh, has uh, quite uh, a frightening. A result on those who have acted upon in terms of implementation and follow-up. And so one thing that we encourage member states to do, especially in the context of their action vis-à-vis -vis the plan of implementation in the next four and a half years, the one I referred before, where we see also an important role for parliament, other national institutions, civil society organization, the judiciary as well, is to try to cluster, to, of course, prioritize in a sense. And in that effort, of course, uh, we are also facilitating in a database that we have created country by country, the clustering of all recommendations, not only of this current cycle of the UPR and not only the Universal Periodic Review, but all the other mechanisms, SDG by SDG, in order to facilitate the task for our development colleagues worldwide to see to what extent certain recommendation may advance an SDG, certain target, and certain implementation action that can be considered in that context. I flag that aligning the development and the human rights requirements seems to us to be important, and as an additional step that the High Commissioner has done consistently, starting with the third cycle of the UPR, is to send letters to the foreign affair minister in order to indicate what, in his views, are areas that deserve particular attention looking at the next four and a half years. We think that that is also a useful tool, a tool that can be uh, helpful not only to the governments but other stakeholders as well, because this communication is available on our website and it's an open document. Thank you for that. That's very helpful. And final, final question, I promise. Um, we have been discussing uh, throughout the inquiry the, the possibility that um, incorporation of certain human rights treaties into Scots law might be one of the most effective ways of guaranteeing their observance, because obviously if uh, people have access to justice when their rights are infringed, then decision makers when making public policy have to concentrate their minds that little bit further to making rights real. Um, in your experience of working with other countries, how effective is it when countries incorporate treaties, particularly, for example, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child? Of course, uh, uh, when it comes to the United Nations and the Office of the A Commissioner, ratification and encouragement ratification is the first step that we make to member states. Um, uh, the next uh, important issue is the fact of implementation and follow-up, in addition to the regular reporting to the treaty bodies when it comes to the international human rights treaties. I'm not sure I'm in a position to say much vis-à-vis -vis internal uh, division of labour, devolution, and 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 uh, modus operandi. No. Thank you very much. Just on, on the, the the point of um, how we do things better in this uh, place, one of the emerging themes from the inquiry that that we have had have been around uh, impact assessments, and we've all got our own challenges with uh, impact assessments because they're only as good as as how well they have been done. Uh, and one of the emerging themes is that each piece of legislation that comes here, especially when it comes to looking at incorporation, that there should be a human rights impact assessment with it. And Roger in his open remarks had said that would be. Good 
good practice to have that human rights impact assessment with uh, any pieces of legislation that comes through this Parliament. Have you got any thoughts or international examples of where human rights impact assessments have been used in pieces of legislation? But also, the other theme that's emerged on this is about the opportunities then for further incorporation of treaties into legislation. So at the earliest point of policy making, we're looking at opportunities in order to um, uh, incorporate. So the human rights impact assessment should include the opportunities available too. If you get any examples that we could use in order to uh, in inform our work, or have you got any thoughts on whether that's a good idea? Um, when it comes to reviewing legislation, draft legislation, to see if it's compatible with human rights, I think many um, parliaments in uh, the, the Westminster system in the Commonwealth have actually been taking the lead on this and making sure that there is a rights-based review of legislation that comes before parliament. Um, it's UK, but also Uganda, Kenya, if I'm not mistaken, Australia, New Zealand... Uh, this has become standard practice. Now, I'm not saying with that that it's always been very successful because, as you say as well, it depends on the assessment, on the seriousness with which the minister involved uh, and the ministry involved ha is presenting this memorandum on compatibility. But, of course, it then also depends on the committees, the parliamentary committees, to make sure that this, this memorandum is very carefully reviewed, critically reviewed. Now... We don't know of concrete examples when it comes to human rights specifically of where parliaments have reviewed the implementation of our human rights three, four, five years afterwards to see if, if, if this compatibility with human rights uh, has been respected in reality. We do know, however, of examples in other areas where this has become standard practice. So for us, the logic is, is, is as well here that as parliaments are doing this more and more in other areas, it also makes a lot of sense to make sure that when it comes to human rights, to make sure that legislation and its implementation is, is properly uh, and systematically reviewed after a number of years. Yeah, that's, that's inc incredibly helpful. Th thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think we'll pr pursue that idea uh, with figure in this committee. Mary, you've got a quick supplementary. Um, th thank you, Convener. I, I just wanted to ask a, a, a very brief um, question of, of both of you. One of the, the other themes that has come out while we've been taking evidence that, that is that it may be an idea to c consider suggesting that every single committee has a human rights rapporteur. Um, and, and I wonder if you thought that would be a sensible way forward and if you have any evidence of, of that in any other um, jurisdictions. Um, I think it's a very interesting idea. Um, if, 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 if uh, obviously, on the understanding that that person is the person in the the other committees um, uh, that is who is open to human rights, committed to human rights, has also sufficient leverage within the committee to make sure that human rights are then taken on. On that understanding, I think it's a very interesting idea. Uh, I'm not aware that this is being followed uh, anywhere else. But I think it, it can be, um, it can be uh, an interesting uh, way of helping ensure that human rights are mainstreamed and that your committee work, committee's work is conveyed to all other committees. But again, I mean, it's on the understanding that this rapporteur, this, this person is the ideal person within that committee to take this forward. Okay. Thank you. Any other committee questions? Uh, Roger and Gianni, have you got any final thoughts uh, for the committee? You've been uh, very patient with us this morning and given us lots of uh, great information, but have you got any final comments to make? Um, if I may, just to thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we think that uh, your own experience is uh, way ahead of uh, where we are in, uh, in other jurisdictions and countries. I would only emphasize one point that has been made by Roger already, which is the importance of strengthening the relationship with the national human rights institutions, and I think also ensuring follow-up action. One thing that we have noted in context in which there is a parliamentary human rights committee and a national human rights institution, that that uh, partnership can really enhance the level of implementation in law and practice vis-à-vis -vis the recommendations 
that emerge from the human rights system, from the Human Rights Council, from the treaty bodies, from the special procedures mandate holder. So we would encourage you to see possibility there as well. Yeah, th thank you for, for, for those kind remarks. Um, following this session with you, we are having a follow-up session on the work we did last year on prejudice-based school bullying. So we are very much taking up the role of ensuring that we come back and look at uh, things that have been done previously and whether there's been any progress. And if there isn't any progress, why there isn't any? And if there is progress, where can we use that good practice in order to push forward uh, uh, the agendas that we want to do? Can I give a grateful thanks on behalf of the committee this morning for your participation all the way from Geneva we hope this is going to be a long and mutually beneficial relationship between our committee and the work that you do uh, in Geneva and in the UN. And we, uh, as I say, we're very grateful for your attendance and your participation this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to suspend committee for a quick 10-minute comfort break to set up the room for the next session.
Uh, good morning and welcome back to the Equality and Human Rights Committee. And before we go into agenda item two, I'd like to welcome the Speaker of the Australian Capital Territory Legislative Assembly, Ms Joy Birch MLA, MLA, and the Clerk of the Assembly, Tom Duncan, who have been observing the meeting from the public gallery. Welcome. Um, agenda item two this morning is a, a follow-up roundtable discussion on our bullying and harassment of children and young people in schools. The piece of work we did last year, it's not cool to be cruel, um, looking at prejudice-based bullying in schools. Um, we have undertook work in coordination with the Education and Skills Committee, and uh, we have carried out some uh, inquiries on this, and they also have carried out an inquiry on personal and social education, because all the things all work together. Um, I understand the Education and Skills Committee is keeping a watching brief on the Scottish Government's review of personal and social education that the Deputy First Minister has written to that committee last month to update them on the timetable of the review, which I think will be of interest to the work that we are doing. Um, this morning, we have many of the organisations around the table who we have spoken to in the course of our inquiry, and I just want to go around the table with a quick um, a who you are and move on quickly, please, and if we can start with you, Bill. Hey, Bill Ramsey, Vice President of the EIS, and just finished 10 years as Equality Convener. Fulton McGregor, the MSP for Copeage and Chrysler. Carol Young, Senior Policy Officer for the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights. Me you go. The broadcaster will switch on your microphone. You don't need to press the buttons so that you're not all pressing your buttons all the way around. Mary. Mary Fee, MSP, West Scotland. Uh, Kate Botterill, um, lecturer in human geography from Edinburgh Napier University. Daniela Saim, lecturer at the University of Strathclyde in Education and Social Justice. Annie Wells, MSP for Glasgow. Carolyn Fox Mackay, Communications Manager, Girl Guiding Scotland. Oliver Mundell, Member of the Scottish Parliament for Dumfriesshire. I'm Ian Smith, uh, Policy and, and Public Affairs Officer at Inclusion Scotland, the National Disabled Peoples Organisation. Cara Spence from LGBT Scotland. I'm a title Senior Programmes and Influencing Manager. I'm Katie Ferguson, Service Director at Respect Me, uh, Scotland's National Anti-Bullying Service. Gail Ross, Member of the Scottish Parliament for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. Good morning, I'm Mary Beryl. I'm HM Inspector and Senior Education Officer for Inclusion and Equality at uh, Education Scotland. Hello everyone, I'm Alex Cole-Hamilton, Lib Dem MSP for Edinburgh Western, Vice Convener of the Human Rights and Equalities Committee. And Christina McKelvey, Convener of the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Thank you to all of you who have, uh, have come back to see us. It's good to see you back. And can I just um, a welcome Catherine um, and Daniela, who are first time at our committee, but they have been working uh, towards uh, looking at prejudice-based bullying uh, of minorities uh, and other aspects that would be of interest to the committee. Um, we are going to go to quickly into opening questions because we do have some limited time this morning, but I want to get the best out of everyone. And many of you have taken part in the round table before, so just catch my eye. I'll put you on the list and I'll call you. Um, and if it's a supplementary, you can make the wee sign of a supplementary, which means that you want in on the back of that. If you can let me know and we can make the conversation as free flowing as possible. I'm going to kick up this morning with Gail Ross. Good morning, everyone. On the back of the committee's uh, anti-bullying report, which fed into the Scottish Government's anti-bullying strategy, what improvements have you seen in your particular sectors? Mm -hmm. Katie. I think that one of the, the, the main advances that, that has happened so far has been within the national policy context. Um, so obviously from um, the, the launch of the, the report, the inquiries um, report, we've seen Respect for All being published and that has a very strong um, commitment to addressing prejudice-based bullying um, and obviously a very clear expectation that that commitment will be translated into practice um, for children and young people um, through school policies and through um, community organisation policies as well. Um, since then, we've also had um, the recording and monitoring guidance, supplementary guidance being published as well, which again contains clear guidance that we need to ensure better recording around prejudice-based incidents as well. So I think for me, there's been um, a, a real strengthening of the national policy framework um, and, and really it's, it's about translating that into practice for, for children and young people. Okay. Ian? Yeah, I think it was, um, 
just follow on from that. Oops, that's a good start. <laughs> uh, just following on from that, um, I was going to say that I think it's a bit early to make any judgment as to what changes have been made because we have just received the national guidance going out. Um, and uh, we'd to see how that plays down into the um, local education authorities' guidance and school um, uh, guidance uh, and how that, that develops. One of the areas which I do agree with uh, what uh, has just been said is the emphasis on prejudice-based bullying within the guidance, which I think is very helpful. Um, again, we have to see how that plays forward. We've seen some good practice in some areas, such as LGBT in schools. But I'm not sure how that is playing out on, in some of the other prejudice areas, uh, for example, in disability, which is the area of particular concern to inclusion in Scotland. Um, it'd be interesting to know how the uh, inspectorate and others will examine this, uh, how you judge what success actually means. For example, the, the, the guidance on recording and monitoring, which I think means that the improved monitoring will come in a bit later this year. You know, does that mean uh, if you actually see an increase in uh, rec recording of some bullying against prejudice uh, and prejudice based, is that actually a success or a failure? Because, um, for example, we've seen on the hate crime statistics that have come out this week, there's been a significant increase in the number of recorded incidents of um, hate crime against disabled people, but does that mean there's more hate crime against disabled people or just more being reported and dealt with? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we need to be clear uh, that there's no disincentives put into the system where people actually think that by recording these things and having an increase, you're actually showing that things are getting worse, then actually you might actually just be picking up a problem that's been there all along and starting to address it. Or shared moment for you then? Yeah. 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 I Sorry. to Cara for uh, spilling a lot all over her papers. <laughs> Lady. Thank you, Convener. I just wanted to follow up on, on the points that have just been made by um, Ian and Katie around recording, because one of the things that we were very clear about in this report was that there should be mandatory recording of all incidents of, um, of bullying, because when we're taking evidence, it was clear when um, schools and teachers w w were coming to us and, and telling us how they monitored and recorded, there was a, a significant degree of unease about recording incidents because of the, the knock-on impact of how they felt their school would be regarded. And we were absolutely clear, every single incident should be recorded to ensure that the proper steps are taken. And, and I just wanted to, to pick up, because you've both used words like better recording and improved recording. And, and, and I wonder if you could clarify, does the, the, the improved and updated guidance say that you should record more or that every single incident, because we are quite clear, every single incident must be recorded? My understanding from the, the guidance is that uh, it will be it should be every single incident, mm -hmm. um, but I, whether how that plays out when it actually comes to mm. schools, you know, there may be a tendency to to just deal with an incident and not record it. Um, I think that probably happens in so, most classrooms, most days that small things happen which are dealt with and not recorded. So it's quite um, one of the big concerns we had and the evidence that we put forward uh, to the original inquiry was that particularly prejudice-based bullying against disabled people is not being recorded and not being picked up. Uh, and what we'd like to see is to ensure that that sort of thing is picked up so that there's a pattern of that happening in, in schools, in any particular school or across schools, then that can be addressed um, as, as systemic behaviour rather than individual incidents. Katie, if you want to, to come back as well, because because I know of the work that you've been doing in schools in the past year. And I think it would be to say that um, in terms of, of what we have, um, the status quo at the moment um, is that you know we're not seeing enough reporting and that the consistency around reporting isn't good enough either. And I think that there was a real consensus that that status quo wasn't good enough and that that needed to change, um, which is why the, this guidance has been really valuable. Um, so I think that the, the guidance will go some way to addressing those issues in terms of more recording so it's clear um, we need to be reporting all um, bullying incidents um, and we need to make clear investigations into all reports of bullying incidents as well but it will also help us improve the consistency which is going to touch on what what Ian has just mentioned in terms of what are we recording making sure that we are recording if um, prejudice attitudes or views have have played a role um, and what the nature of those have been I think you, you 
you touched on culture shift, and that's a hugely important part to this as well. So there's a lot of um, softer work that needs to happen um, alongside this guidance in terms of training, um, in terms of really having discussions with schools and with teachers about how to actually go about implementing this guidance and creating that consistency and approach. And I think we also need to recognise that um, there's an issue of culture shift among children and young people too, where they will actually come forward and talk about bullying incidents that are affecting them so that we can therefore um, set about addressing those issues too. Um, so we need to make sure that, that young people feel safe to disclose when bullying is happening. Um, although obviously we, we recognise that, that professionals will often pick up and notice um, issues and, and be able to proactively address those as well. Um, and I think that that is important to, to acknowledge that this data collection that will happen um, is, is going to inform preventative strategies around bullying um, and around prejudice bullying as well as the, the reactive nature of responding to incidents. Mary, can I bring Carol and then Cara in and we can come back to the substantive question? Thanks. Um, CRER was involved in the working group that helped to develop the new um, guidance on recording and monitoring of uh, bullying and we, we definitely welcomed the, the opportunity to input to that and the result of that process I think is a, a much more concise and straightforward monitoring form. There's still things that need to be addressed there for instance there's no way for people to record racist incidents which aren't bullying on that system and we have a concern that that's going to end up getting lost from practice entirely as a result. Um, that's something that's still to be tackled. But I think overall um, our feeling on it was that we're pretty disappointed that the committee's recommendation for mandatory recording wasn't taken up by Scottish Government. Um, we've seen over the years that there has been fairly consistent advice from Scottish Government and loads of good work done by Respect Me um, to try and convince education authorities and schools of the importance of recording. And it's thus far been unsuccessful. Um, we're actually about to launch some research that we did as a sort of baseline before the launch of Respect for All, which was looking at the um, statistics that we could get through freedom of information requests on the levels of racist incidents and prejudice-based bullying incidents in schools in Scotland. Um, and to be frank, the data that's in there is not worth the paper it's written on. It's very, very low levels. So we would expect to see if this is successful um, a dramatic rise in incident recording, which would be reflective of better practice and make sense for schools to be aware of what's actually going on so that they can um, deal with it appropriately. Um, so for us, an increased number of incidents would be a good thing, definitely. Um, but we would like to see um, further down the line this approach being robustly evaluated by Scottish Government. And if it is found that these voluntary approaches still aren't working, then I, I do believe there has to be some move towards mandatory recording mm. of bullying. OK, Thank, thanks, Carol. Cara? Yeah, I agree with Katie that I think the major thing that we can comment on right now is the changes in the policy context. So we were really pleased to have the national approach launched. We were uh, also pleased that it, uh, I think robustly included prejudice-based bullying. Um, so that was really good. And for, for us, it was, it was also good to see that the needs of lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender young people were taken into account within this. And we worked quite closely with the Scottish Government on this. Um, however, we also felt that more detail was needed for teachers in terms of the, how they practically respond to incidents. So what we did is we produced guidance alongside the National Approach to Anti-Bullying, um, which was supported by the Learning Directorate, and this was distributed to every school in Scotland. And we've started to see this play out in terms of impact in terms of school policies. So through our LGBT charter work and work with schools, we review schools policies. So, uh, so I'm starting to see a trickle down effect through the national approach and through our guidance. Um, so I, I can say that there certainly has been some impact, but it's, it's difficult to, to comment on how it's affected a whole school environment and culture at this stage. 
Um, in terms of monitoring and recording, I think there's something about the, the system will always be slightly flawed unless it comes directly from children and young people um, because teachers will be the conduit to recording that and there will be fears. However, in the meanwhile, I think what's important is we get messages right for teachers and schools that actually having high numbers is actually a good thing. Um, I, I would imagine that initially numbers will be low, so it will take time for us uh, to encourage teachers and encourage schools um, to report incidents. And I would also advocate for um, moving forward how we might find anonymous ways for young people to report incidents. Not all young people have strong relationships with their teachers or feel able to come forward. So if there were, if there were ways to be electronic or find ways for young people to report incidents as they occur, I think we'll get much more accurate statistics. Okay, thank you. Carolyn. What um, Cara has just said, um, uh, the evidence that we heard from young people at the last committee meeting was incredibly powerful and a lot of it focused on their ability to, um, to speak up about those incidents and <clears throat> the fact that they didn't feel that teachers really understood what it meant, what, whether this was an incident of bullying or not and without robust training um, to ensure that teachers are aware of what counts and what doesn't. Um, in terms of this, then no amount of recording will make any difference in that. Um, and I don't think we've seen that yet. And I think that's what the young people that we brought forward were really saying, was that they really need to feel that they are being listened to in those incidents and at the time. Thank you. Danielle. I wasn't at the first meeting, so I think it's perhaps a um, good moment to bring in some new evidence. So we carried out research with over a thousand young people who are um, born in Central Eastern Europe, living in Scotland and the rest of the UK. Um, and what they said in the survey is that 77 percent of them have experiences, experienced uh, racism and xenophobia, or xenophobic uh, attacks, and the vast majority of these incidents happened in <coughs> school. Of the th over 1,100 who completed the survey, we had 565 of them who described incidents of, so half of them described incidents of racist, xenophobia and bullying that happened uh, predominantly in schools. And these incidents range from uh, verbal attacks, so being called terrorist, illegal, arrived on the boat, <coughs> prostitute, uh, to being mocked about their accent, the way they look, the way they speak, uh, to f very serious uh, physical attacks to themselves and their property and their family. Uh, and to echo points that were made before, a lot of them said that they did not report and do not report because these incidents happen on an everyday basis. So 20% of them said this happens on an everyday basis. It's normalized. Um, teachers hear uh, this incident. Sometimes teachers were accused, teachers were perpetrators of some of these attacks. Um, and half of them said they've seen an increase in racism and xenophobia since Brexit. Uh, so for this particular group, and that extended to other groups, so they said for this particular group, um, the incidents have gone up since uh, the uh, Brexit referendum. Um, the issue of uh, teachers um, not being able to manage the incidents or deal with incidents was raised by several of them. Um, and quite a lot of them said that this wasn't taken seriously because they were white. So 97% of them identified as white and this wouldn't be taken seriously. Um, and the issue of teachers being prepared or uh, knowledgeable and dealing with incidents was, was mentioned by many. Um, and we were quite interested in seeing if uh, Scotland is in a sense different from the rest of the UK, and we had no statistically significant difference in data to suggest that there's a difference. Um, so uh, the fact that we're talking about um, these issues is encouraging, but definitely a gap in uh, teacher training um, in policy and practice at school levels as well. C Catherine, you, you've got complementary work mm. that, that you have an up-to-date research on this too. Well, it's not that up to date, so I can't comment on the progress made, but just linking to a point that Daniela made. So my research is um, research, a qualitative study throughout Scotland with young people from different ethnic and religious minority backgrounds. So we engaged with 382 people across urban, suburban and rural Scotland, but this was in around 2014-15. But some of the themes are very, I'm kind of hearing from people around the table, very much resonate with what we found then. Um, so it was really just a point to kind of back up what Daniela was saying around 
what the perception of prejudice-based bullying is, and that can be very complex in terms of identifying it potentially as teachers, but also for young people themselves. So there's often cases in which we found in the research people would talk about racism as just banter, for example. So whether that's recognised as an issue um, by the young people themselves and how that kind of plays out in relationships is really complex. The other um, point I want to make is about misrecognition. So with um, young Central and Eastern European um, young people, often people are misrecognised as being a different nationality or potentially within um, religious minorities as well. So lots of young Sikh, Hindu, um, uh, South Asian young people would talk about being misrecognised as Muslim and therefore experiencing Islamophobia. But there's quite a lot of complexity in perceiving that as, um, I mean, it would still be a religious-based bullying, um, but in terms of being misrecognised, there's, there's just lots of complexity that I think should be put into some of the training materials and CPD um, around how we might identi perceive um, racist, um, racist and religious bullying. Um, also, I think just this might be another question, but related to the protected characteristics, I know that was in the report saying that the protected characteristics are going to be something within the CPD training. Um, nationality is not within the protected characteristics. However, for lots of Central and Eastern European young people, their nationality and also their migrant status is potentially a source of stigmatisation. And that's an additional factor, I think, to that should be talked about within that, that training context around protected, because it's Otherwise, we might we might have people being put into boxes, and if it doesn't quite fit into that box, it doesn't get perceived as bullying. Does that make sense? Mm. Right. Thanks very much, Carol. <coughs> that, um, provided that the resources are developed properly, um, covering the protected characteristics would include nationality, because ethnic and national origin is part of the protected characteristic of race. Um, but it's definitely true to say that I think the vast majority of people working in the education sector won't recognise that. And there's significant support needed to make sure that people can understand and tackle these issues on the ground. Thanks very much. Daniela. Uh, just briefly on the uh, impact of this on uh, young people, we also asked them how they deal with this incident and what they do. Um, and there's all, all sorts of things that young people said they do in the situations from um, sometimes giving a different nationality because they think that that would protect them in themselves, so hide their nationality, hide their uh, ethnic identity, so particular groups who are vulnerable, the Roma migrant groups. So um, there are um, several characteristics that would put people in more vulnerable situations, so migrant, Roma, and from a poorer background, making people more vulnerable. Um, and quite often they would say they would try and hide that. Uh, again, since the Brexit referendum, uh, young people talked about um, trying to hide their identity in public spaces, so not using their home language on, um, in the schools or in public um, uh, transport uh, for fears of attack. Some of them have suffered uh, this incident. And this has had direct impact on things like their mental health. We had 16% of them in the sample reported um, mental ill health, a higher rate than the overall uh, population. Their attainment is suffering, so uh, Polish young people are uh, doing less well in uh, schools than white Scottish uh, uh, young people on all the other ethnic minority groups. Uh, there's higher rates of school abandonment that were reported uh, to me by schools uh, from uh, young people who suffer racism and xenophobia in school. Uh, we have lower rates of service use reported by them and so on, so a spiralling effect on their ability to participate in um, social activities. Um, so um, going back to this idea of how they, uh, you know, they cope with this in, in, in schools, you know, it's the idea that they try and blend in as much as possible, don't want to stand out, uh, and how that's affecting their attainment, so direct impact on, the, on their attainment as well as their uh, mental health and well-being. Okay, thank you. Bill? Um, I think th three things I want to focus on, if I may, because they went around. First of all, training. Uh, teachers need time to train, and uh, there are two challenges there. Uh, firstly, uh, what their perceptions of what will, in, in relation to the professional development, 
uh, employers need to signpost that this training is valuable in their professional development. Uh, because if employers say that training is more valuable than this training culturally, then you know, we don't need to unpack the result of that. Uh, secondly, in terms of recording, and I think the point was made uh, uh, by Cara, I think it was early, earlier on, and uh, Ian, about recording. And uh, I mean, uh, we did our head teachers uh, network last week, and I uh, was talking to some of our head teachers, explaining I was going to be giving evidence this morning. And one of the head teachers said to me, the point that Ian was making, we were putting in, you know, we were putting in a lot of effort recording. And then, cut a long story short, some time later, they were on the front page of a tabloid because they'd actually done their job well. Uh, you know, what they'd done, they'd done a really good job and they ended up on the front page of a tabloid with a pejorative story. And that is a huge problem, which, you know, le leads us into the media thing. For instance, I mean, we, a good example, um, Daniela mentioned predominantly in schools. That's a fair point. But what a journalist will do, pick that up, and run with another narrative. And, and, and that's the sort of challenges that we face, training and how it's filtered by the media. I think that's really important. But I think the, the, the work and the discourse that's going on, we really welcome because it has to be done. And as we've seen in the last week, it's, it, it's not going to get any better. Thanks, Bill. Cara? Um, just on the topic of research, LGBT Scotland uh, published research in February 2018 um, with a sample of almost 700 LGBT young people, and it showed that 71% of LGBT young people experienced bullying in schools on the grounds of being lesbian, gay, bisexual or transgender. It talked about the impact on them was a, a significant impact on their mental health, but for the first time we have really strong evidence that has an impact on their, on their attainment um, and also their ability to actually attend school. So 20% of LGBT young people left school as a direct result of homophobic, biphobic and transphobic bullying. Um, I'm not going to go into lots of details because I know we've, we've looked at a lot of research in the past. I think there is something about research and, and the long-term approach to it, though, and how the Scottish Government might take that forward. Um, and I would suggest perhaps looking at the Behaviour in the Scottish <coughs> Schools survey and ensuring that it has specific information on prejudice-based bullying, but also unpicking some of the, the protected characteristics and, and aspects of that so we can dig a little bit deeper there. Um, because it's, it's one thing about individual organisations carrying out research, but there needs to be a long-term approach. And also looking at trends over time would be really useful to see. Mary, sorry, uh, Katie, I'm going to bring Mary in right now. But Mary, I think we've heard a few uh, indications this morning about data collection, how we collect data, how that's used in inspections, the impact on attainment. I'm sure that's something of interest uh, to you and the work that you do. Uh, one of the recommendations from our inquiry last year was to, to, to really... Um, look at how inspections are done, the data that's collected from that, and looking at the health and wellbeing aspect of that in an inspection uh, regime. Can you give us an update? Thank you. Well, as you mentioned at the start, uh, it's obviously the work in terms of the PSE uh, thematic inspection. That work is just nearing the end of phase two, and the report is in a draft form. It's not yet been quality assured. But that was certainly 55 schools across Scotland, including early year centres and special schools. So I think, certainly think the information that that will produce will be, will be very fruitful in terms of discussion going forward, bearing in mind that in primary schools, the focus is health and wellbeing rather than PSC. And we, you know, certainly there's been previous discussions on that. So fortunately, I'm not at the stage I can share any more information at the moment, but I certainly feel that may be of, of good interest to this group going forward. Um, certainly Education Scotland has, since um, the work with this committee and the, the publication of Respect for All, Education Scotland has done a lot of work. And I thought simply because inspection from Ian was one of the first aspects mentioned, just to say that we have updated our guidance to all inspectors in terms of our safeguarding. And we previously spoke that safeguarding is one of the quality indicators that's common to all inspection. And we take that extremely important, importantly. We updated this in December 2017. We have also shared with all inspectors, respect me in terms of that information. So they are fully equipped when they're going out to do this. Because consistency of approach is so important here, and we've heard that from many people. 
with your indulgence, I'll just read a few sentences out. Wider safeguarding issues such as bullying will also be evaluated. This will involve, for example, looking at the overall number of incidents, trends or patterns over time, social media related incidences and effectiveness of approaches. The guidance, Respect for All, and it's quoted there as a hyperlink, provides useful information as to how schools should prevent bullying and record and monitor incidences. It goes on also to talk about the information from Included and Engaged Part 2, which was also updated uh, just before Christmas. So there is more text here. But certainly, this is the guidance as issued to inspectors, and this came out in 20 in December 2017. Therefore, this is progress in terms. But clearly, there are other aspects um, of the work we're doing. We're supporting a number of the work streams and committees related to this. We work very closely with most people in this room now. We have called on, our, on these different agencies to help us to update the information we have on our National Improvement Hub. The information is fresh, it's been updated. We track to ensure that we have all the different protected characteristics covered to ensure there are no gaps. We know that there are areas that we need to improve. We're looking at gathering more information, but we want this to be a quality destination for teachers where they can very easily access, because building on what Katie said is the cultural shift that is so important here. And there will not be one single resolution to that. It'll be all of us working together. We also support both the monitoring um, and tracking and, the ch and recording working group, and also the LGBT sort of national inclusion, education inclusion working group as well. So we are involved in many different aspects of that, um, supporting the work of this group. Thank you, May. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, convener. I'd like to pick up on a number of things that particularly Cara has said, and we've heard a number of our panellists uh, mention as well, and that's around homophobic abuse in schools. Um, I, I've been particularly struck through the conduct of our inquiry through my association and that of others uh, with the Thai campaign, at just how much we still have to do in this area. Not least there was a, a very vicious attack in a, a local school in my constituency very recently on a homophobic basis. The um, anniversary uh, well, it was 30 years ago this year that uh, Section 28 or Clause 2A was put into the Local Government and Communities Act prohibiting any discussion of homosexuality in the school environment, and thankfully that was repealed some 11 years later. But uh, the shadow of that looms very large over our education establishment. I think it's true to say that some teachers still have anxiety about what they're allowed to talk about in respect of homosexuality, particularly in faith schools. Um, and I want to know what the panellists believe we, need, we can do to foster a better, more uh, confident um, environment for our teachers to, first of all, uh, talk about homosexuality and bisexuality and uh, transgender issues as a normal part of the human condition in the school environment, but also how to support young people who are uh, thinking about their own identity and address the, the bullying that's still very much at large in our schools. It, Cara, I think maybe that's directed at you. Eh? Um, well, there's lots that, that can be done. I think um, if you're talking about building the confidence of teachers, it needs to be training. One thing we also need to recognise, I think a lot of teachers get a lot of negative feedback. And one thing I'm very clear about, that I think we need to recognise and celebrate success. There is some great work happening in schools and finding ways to showcase that. It allows teachers to realise that it is possible, it's something they cannot do. Regardless, though, they will, there will still be teachers that are resistant to this area of, that, of work. And part of that is a legacy of Section 28. Um, so one of the things that we're really strong about is that we need to find a way to create that consistency and say this is something that you must do. And without that, I think progress will be slow. Will be slow. Um, and that's because of legislation that has happened in the past. Um, so I'm really pleased that Mary talked about the inspection frameworks. I think that's one way you, could, you can create consistency and say to schools, you have to do this. Um, but we may want to look at legislation as well. And I'm aware we're going through a process of education reform. 
um, with the Education Act. And I wonder if this committee's thought about how prejudice-based bullying could be embedded into that act and whether they're connecting with the Education Committee. If we want this to happen and we're taking this seriously, um, my question is, do we need to legislate for it? We legislated for Section 28, that's all I'm saying. Well, all of it, quick supplementary on this, yeah? But that was exactly my question. It was really, do, uh, do people here today feel that legislation is required to move this forward? We're sat here a year on from uh, this committee's report, and I mean, I think it would be fair to say progress has been slow. I'm not allocating blame to, to, to anyone for that, but do you think legislation would focus people's minds on moving some of these issues forward? Question. Bill, I wonder if you wanted to come in for your teacher's yeah. perspective. Well, yeah. first of all, the Institute doesn't have a position on that specific question. But I think, as the discussion has shown, you need actions after the words. You need training. And uh, to some extent, I have to repeat what I've said, you, you, you need that training. I think, the, I think we're seeing a change in culture. I think uh, as... A, the historical example of Section 28 becomes further in the past, that lessens its effect. I mean, a good example in a, in a, is look what, for instance, um, Tom Devine has said about sectarianism, you know, that, it's, that, it's, that historically it's starting to wither to some extent. And I think, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to say that, 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 that it's exactly the same, but that, that there is a, a generational change, shall we say, within the demographic of the profession. Uh, and you know th th that's moving on, so that will have an impact, and that will be a positive impact. So, uh, in that regard, I think think that's important. As far as the legislation is concerned, we do not we do not have a position on that. But we do know that um, an act is one thing; resources, training, at the end of the day, is what changes culture. You know, a, a piece of legislation is crucial. Words are really, really important. But training, time to train. That's what will change the culture. Katie, can you want to, want to talk about some of the work that you're actually doing in schools then yeah, to address just, some of these points? Sure, yeah, and I just had a, a quick point off the back of that as well. I think that, you know, when we consider this point around legislation, I think it's really important to look at what legislation we already have in place and how well that's actually been implemented. Um, so the Equality Act, GTCS regulations, UNCRC, you know, what are these policy and legislative frameworks, how are these actually making a difference on the ground um, for young people? And, and what are the other legal um, that we can be using to create real change, and that's, that's around the curriculum um, inspection and, and training to, to create that attitudinal shift as well. So I think it, it's, um, it's a complex area that, that we really need to look at all of those issues. Um, in terms of our work, um, I can give you a, an update in terms of local authorities. So um, clearly, uh, within Respect for All, there's a very clear expectation um, that local authorities will have a, a policy, an anti-bullying policy, which is in line with with respect for all, um, and that, that is then translated into consistent anti-bullying policies among schools um, and, and other community-based organisations that support young people as well. Um, so I think it's, it's safe to say that Respect for All has certainly placed fresh impetus on this. We're working with a number of local authorities. We're working with eight um, local authorities who are all carrying out review um, into their anti-bullying policies. Um, we have around... It's, I have to kind of pretext all of this by saying that um, it's always a very fluid area in terms of um, where, pol where authorities are at with this work. Um, but certainly there are 14 authorities who currently have um, anti-bullying policies that are in date, in step um, with, with the, the, some of the, the newer shifts within Respect for All. Um, and there's 10, pol 10 authorities that we've identified um, who need to review their policies, they're due um, to review those policies and we'll be working with them, we've written to those authorities to, to put forward our offer of support in terms of policy development and also training um, and resources that we can offer. Um, so I, I, we have to also say that um, 
you know, Respect Me has been around for 10 years now. We were set up 10 years ago um, and we've worked with all 32 authorities within that, that period. Um, however, our focus now is to make sure that some of the, the, the newer shifts in the current guidance, Respect for All, in terms of a, a focus on prevention, um, that explicit commitment to prejudice-based bullying um, and, and some of the other kind of nuances and shifts within this guidance is fully reflected and embedded into those policies. So that work is continuing um, and we're going to find it really important to work in partnership with Education Scotland um, and with other organisations around this table as well to see that kind of change and shift um, across Scotland. Thanks, Katie. Catherine? Just a point to pick up on what Katie was saying around um, embedding it in the curriculum. Now, I'm not an expert in <coughs> curriculum design, so perhaps this is already taking yeah. place. But it seems that um, embedding ideas about difference within the curriculum as accepting difference it, within the curriculum rather than because I know that in the in the report there was actually an emphasis on commonality which I really mm. welcome as in not to pit people against each other however if we do too much of that there's a there's a um, it, we have to be cautious about flattening out difference and actually talking about different identities doesn't have to be people don't have to be scared or it doesn't have to be a problem so there must be a way to do that by embedding kind of these type, type of histories like you were saying um, around the history of of our country um, in terms of different um, identities and, and things like decolonizing the curriculum for example would be how you would talk about it in, in terms of race um, but in terms of LGBT, talking about those histories, I think, is really important. And actually, some of the pe young people we interviewed felt that they, they were worried or, or apprehensive around talking about race sometimes because they would get put in a particular box. So maybe making space for that is also important. Yeah, good point. I think the inclusion, uh, the, the Time for Inclusion working group uh, within government have been do, doing a lot of work on that. Ian, you, you wanted back in. Yeah, I think it's... Um, Embedding this approach into the, the curriculum shouldn't be about levelling out, it should be about actually celebrating difference. Uh, it's about developing equalities and human rights based approaches uh, throughout the, the curriculum. Um, I think some of the best practices in schools are, are actually ones which have been almost pupil led from a you know, rights based approach, um, including some of the, the LGBTI straight alliances in some of the schools uh, and some of the peer support groups within, within schools which address some of these bullying issues. And one of the issues for people who are subject to prejudice-based bullying is they may not want to report it um, to an adult or to anyone else because they don't want their difference to be uh, known. And so you need to look at ways of providing them support um, through, and, and sometimes peer support organisations and anonymous reporting and things are, are ways of doing that. So I think there is a lot of good practice out there. Um, on the issue of legislation, I think we've got to be careful we don't actually accidentally do perverse things with legislation. Um, Bill mentioned earlier about the impact of, uh, if you actually record properly the amount of uh, bullying, you end up with more bullying on your school stats, and that might lead to uh, um, bad newspaper stories. Well, the, part of that might be that if you actually start devolving more responsibilities to head teachers in, in legislation, um, they become more responsible for what happens in their school. They might actually find those perverse ways of not, uh, that they don't actually want to report the bullying because it reflects on them and their school in a, a negative way in, in, in the media and in other recordings. So we've got to ensure that when we do changes to legislation, we don't accidentally do something which has a negative effect. Uh, and also, if you have a more devolved response for schools, how do you ensure there's actually a consistent approach across um, all levels, all schools, all levels? Good, 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 good point. Daniela? Three points. One on the um, curriculum. Um, I think definitely we need to um, engage with the education committee and encourage a um, refresher and a look at the curriculum because what young people say, many of them, is that they do not recognise themselves in the curriculum or in the curricular materials. Um, so if you are LGBT, if you have a disability, if you are from a migrant background, you, you just do not see yourself in some of the materials that are uh, covered in the, in the curriculum. 
curriculum. So um, definitely looking at how we, you said about celebrating diversity, but also the fact that uh, young people have multiple identities that they uh, rely on at uh, different points in their lives. So you're not just a migrant, you're not just disabled, you are probably you know, migrant, disabled, uh, LGBT, a certain age and so on. And how do we capture that intersectional uh, dimension of people's lives in the curriculum and how we don't just talk about one dimension uh, at a time and how we get teachers to think about that I think is really important. I've been told not to lean on. Um, <clears throat> and the second point on uh, teacher training, as somebody who's been involved in initial teacher training for the last 15 years, I can definitely see a shift in the type of um, teacher training that we do. These issues are definitely now in the initial uh, teacher training programs. We do talk a lot more about how um, new teachers should think about these issues in a different way and tackle these issues. But I will say they do. we do have a very limited amount of time with uh, students on the course. So this needs to be a CPD issue that local authorities buy into. I mean, we have, you know, they have 10 lectures, uh, sorry, 10 weeks at the university and then they go in schools and then come back for 10 weeks. And, you know, in a year's time, somebody is doing a PGD as finish their training. So it's a very short period of time for them to get um, um, conversant with issues of equality and children's rights and human rights and so on. So we really need local authorities to make this a priority for uh, CPD training. Miri. Thank you. Just uh, to talk a bit about the curriculum. I certainly agree that um, in terms of the formalised curriculum, the curriculum where there's very much a transfer of knowledge and a development of if new skills very much within the classroom setting. High quality resources are very important for teachers and teachers always value high quality resources. Certainly we're working with Career and Bemis to look at the resources available in terms of race, um, try and quality assure what's there, but also to look at some of the gaps. I think that's very important. Teachers are very busy. They just want to be able to access high quality resources. That's a way of ensuring there's a consistency of message but in terms of equality and diversity, in terms of teaching that, um, I think the more important context of the curriculum is about the ethos, the culture and relationships that exist within a school. Because very much about feeling valued and equality and feeling valued, you know, certainly coexist. That comes from the school recognising all, valuing all, having a, a culture where they celebrate success and it pulls it all together. It's also where the policies and, and staff model, you know, strong, positive relationships and there's the development of the, of the key adult, the caring role. That, to me, is um, a very important context of the curriculum for this type of work. Uh, so teaching it maybe, you know, a couple of periods a week would always be less important than actually experiencing it. Bill. Yeah, that, that, this, this thing about the... Inter and about the culture is really important. I mean, I was at a discussion earlier with Mary, and one of the features is when you go into a school, in the first 10, 15 minutes, you pick up this intangible culture of a place. Uh, and I'm not being very specific here, colleagues, but that is absolutely vital. And where you have that, uh, when, you know, when the issues we're trying to deal with emerge, then they, they sort of jar with that culture and it gets picked up. So where you have a, a, a welcoming culture, where, where the ways feel safe, basically, when something unsafe happens, then, then, then it's notice, noticeable. Um, and, and that is very important. I'm sorry this contribution in the last few seconds has been somewhat in, you know, in, uh, intangible, but that, that cultural aspect is really, is really important. And I think the point about the teacher education institutions, the picture is somewhat mixed. And, and, but that's the nature of life, I suppose. But, but really, I think there are some wh where the practice is better than others, and some of the TIs could learn from other TIs. I'll not name names. <laughs> I, went in, uh, I went into a school last week in my constituency, St John Ogilvy, actually one of the pupils is in the gallery today, um, with, with Katie last week, where they launched their new anti-bullying strategy, where they'd worked uh, very closely since uh, uh, working uh, here in the work of the committee last year. And when I walked in, there was a pupil-led... Um, a, a 
um, presentation going on on Equally Safe. Now, being the chair of the cross-party group Men's Violence Against Women, to walk in and, and hear teenagers leading a session on Equally Safe and, and, and aspects like that was very good. But I got that feeling the minute I walked uh, in the door. Uh, and if you do get that, you can see a culture change. And that's a school who realised they did have a problem and have worked very, very closely with the organisations in order to change that. So you're, you're absolutely right on that aspect. But it's where you see that tangible you know, change and how can we bottle that and then give it to all the other schools. I want to bring in Fulton first, and then I'm going to come back to, to some of the, the other uh, members. Fulton. Yeah, thanks, Kavina. I was wanting to touch issue on the um, touch quickly, sorry, on the issue of young people and mental health. It's talked about quite regularly in this parliament and various forums, and particularly perhaps where um, you, know, you know people are at a stage where they maybe don't need support from CAMS but do need some support. And I obviously want to bring it into the context of bullying. It's already been uh, touched on today that. There might be mental health issues for victims of bullying at school. There may also be mental health issues for children who are bullying. And I suppose that um, are, is, there could also be questions around are, are people bullied because of perhaps having a mental health problem uh, in line with the, the prejudice-based bullying. So what, I suppose what I'm asking the panel is um, what, uh, what do you think schools um, can do to identify these issues in the context of bullying early um, and to offer support to young people who may be experiencing it. Cara, the work that you did uh, with LGBTI Scotland and the, um, the survey that you did, mental health was a very clear recurring theme in that, and I know Inclusion have done some work on that as well, but Cara, would you be in a position to... Yes, I mean, I would say the majority of the work that we do with, with LGBT young people is around their mental health and confidence. Um, at the moment, their experience of CAMS, and there's a lot of uh, knowledge of this already, is, is particularly difficult. There's often very long waiting lists, and uh, when they do get an appointment, they may not have the best experience. For example, if a transgender young person um, gets a referral, they may not have the understanding, the confidence and skills to give them uh, the correct support. So they often they report having a worse experience and they come back to us. Um, but there's also something about that CAMS is viewed as this, uh, it, will, it will fix you if you go to CAMS. But there's a lot of young people who are in that middle ground who actually don't necessarily need a, a diagnosis as such, they just need someone to talk to and, su and support. So what we need to think about is how, how we can create uh, and resource ways in which young people can talk to somebody. That is the thing that makes a difference, where they can talk about how they feel. Um, and there's a range of ways to do that. I mean, one of, one of the ways that we've... I, I had it was in a conversation with a colleague yesterday around counsellors in schools and whether that was a way to go. Um, so that might be a way forward. If we invest in it, though, I think we need to invest in it properly. Um, it wouldn't be about well one councillor for an entire school or for a geographical area. I think, and I think we need to think about from early years upwards as well. How are we? How can children and young people have someone to talk to um, from from early years onwards? Um, and there's also for us something about how you invest in youth services. A lot of children and young people don't necessarily want to talk to their teachers. Um, I would much rather go to an external service, a service and don't necessarily want to have those moments in classroom where you have to come out and go and speak to a counsellor. Mm -hmm. Actually going somewhere else is, is sometimes the best option for them. Ian. Uh, yeah, um, I think, again, talking about some of the, the, the examples I've heard of, um, where, which are people peer support system networks, which can, can be very helpful. Um, the safe spaces that people can, can go to when they feel uh, under threat or having a, a mental health issue, um, low level concerns. Um, one of the things we've got to be wary of, though, is creating um, places where people are excluded from the rest of the school rather than included as part of it. Um, so I think you've got to be very careful how that is done in a way which actually is inclusive of people. Um, I think I agree that staff, uh, that, that school counselling services are, are probably a, a vital part of, of providing a, a solution on mental health, um, but also early access to um, mental health services, CAMHS, uh, CAM, CAM uh, when required, is, is actually quite important. Katie? 
just wanted to pick up on the aspects of um, your question around children who display bullying behaviour and actually what's going on for those children. And I think that's really important um, that we do that. And I think that's one of the ways in which our national approach in Scotland is, is quite progressive and that it's, it's talking about children who display bullying behaviour and experience bullying behaviour. And we've really stepped away um, from labelling children as, as bullies, um, you know, suggesting that there's something inherent in their identity or, or character that, that um, is, is leading to this behaviour. So I think focusing on the behaviour um, and, and really thinking about behaviour as, as a communication <laughs> of what is going on for a child or young person and really encouraging practitioners to engage with that and to try and help um, that, that child or young person understand um, what is maybe leading to, to this behaviour in terms of feelings, needs or attitudes and actually addressing that. Um, I think that, that is a, a really important approach and a really important approach in terms of actually changing and reducing bullying behaviour which will then have you know, a, a huge impact on um, improving mental health outcomes for, for children and young people. I'm, I'm just thinking about, we are talking about what happens in schools, but there's also other aspects of what spills outside of schools and into other organisations. And Girl Guiding gave us some very compelling evidence last year, um, and I know that, that you are, you're doing ongoing work in the Citizen Girl uh, um, project, which was highlighted very successfully in this parliament a few weeks ago, is a great example of that. I wonder if you give us some insights into where you've seen any progress? Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to touch on the peer-to-peer -peer support very quickly, first of all. So peer-to-peer um, -peer support is something that we see is really, really important for uh, gender-based bullying, especially. Um, and a lot of that comes around the fact that girls therefore have a single gender space to discuss issues. And one of those issues is obviously mental health. Um, hugely important when it comes to um, gender based bullying that, well, mental health is hugely connected. You know, we see impact on confidence, uh, ability to speak out, attainment, all of those areas. So um, we offer peer to peer support within uh, a girl guiding context, but that's often not modelled in schools in a single gender way, which is where we feel you get the most out of that. Um, but moving on to your actual question, um, in terms of progress, I think we've heard a lot about reporting. Very happy to see that. Um, in terms of other progress, I think we can see across whole of society that um, with Me Too and other campaigns that, that sexism is an endemic problem that we have in Scotland and beyond. And until it is tackled at more of a societal level, I think we'll, we won't see that fully filtering down into schools. Um, we have done some research, which we'll be delighted to share with the committee once released, but it, it echoes the problem we, we highlighted last year and in fact sees it getting worse. Um, so, I mean, there is still a lot to do and I'm sorry, I can't come with a more positive message, but I think there hasn't been a lot of progress in the last year. OK, we need to hear that, but we do need to hear that. Daniela point about uh, the stigma around mental health in schools and despite a kind of ongoing efforts to address and enable teachers to talk about mental health in school there's still huge stigma around mental health and that can lead to uh, some of the bullying actually you were mentioning children were bullied because of their mental ill health um, and this, uh, this comes in a kind of range of issues that teachers are to maybe worried to talk about because they might say the wrong thing or not address it in the wrong way. So mental health is one of them. Um, I was men mentioned before, um, uh, sexual orientation, um, sexual education in general. Uh, in our research was Brexit and politics. They don't want to talk about it because they think it's too political and they might say the wrong thing or upset children rather than so. On. So this goes back to creating that culture where teachers have support from each other to, if they don't know how to address it, well, how do I do this as a new, newly qualified teacher? So having the culture in which um, mental health is not stigmatized by the school or by the pupils or by staff sometimes in, in the way, and sometimes can be very subtle, non verbal verbal messages that are given to children who are uh, excluded by teachers and they pick up on that to say, oh, it's probably because of my mental health issues or uh, behavior and so on. And something that wasn't mentioned before in relation to culture, I think leadership and was mentioned in the report, how important that is to have a head teacher who makes these issues priority. And they say, we're going to talk about this in an open way. And they find the language together to talk about, um, you know, the sensitive issues that uh, young people are grappling with. Thank you. Lady. Thank you. 
Well, again, as mentioned earlier, because the PSC uh, thematic inspection has just finished, um, the mental health counselling was one of the areas we looked at. But also we looked at the more universal entitlements in terms of mental health. I have to say that my own personal experience of inspecting is that mental health is an area that increasingly schools are much more aware of and, and much more focused. And I certainly acknowledge Dan Daniela's comment that it comes very much from the leadership identifying. I saw, uh, without preempting the report, obviously, but there are a number of um, effective interventions, uh, resilience training, restorative attachment. These, and this is a new lexicon for a lot of teachers, but these are, are popular and people are using them in the classrooms to help children to develop strategies which will be lifelong for them. The children will talk to you about the learning pit when you fall into that pit where you, I can't do it. And the children will tell you, I can do it. I've just got to keep going. I've got to climb out of the pit. And this is all the emotional intelligence, the language, emotional literacy that children are developing uh, in many schools. So certainly, uh, but the targeted interventions for those who the mental health is much more enduring, Obviously, that will also link in terms of additional support needed, ESL legislation. That also goes on, certainly a number of the schools had mental health counselling, community link workers, family link workers. All of these play a very important role. Okay. I've got a couple of colleagues who want to come in. Oliver, did you want to come in on this? Yeah. yeah well, and then I've got Annie, then I've got Mary. It's, it's back a little bit, convenient, but it's sort of linked to this. It was just around the point on, on culture. Um, I, I understand the point around intangible culture and walking into school, but it's more of a comment than a question. I feel, linking into Daniela's point, that for a lot of teachers where uh, time is set out within the curriculum, where there are formal sessions, it does make it much easier for people to talk about difficult issues. It creates a space uh, where, where they feel uh, that they're not overstepping the mark you know, by, by dedicating time uh, to them and also um, I think for pupils themselves, it's pupil-led initiatives are really important, but there's also something in seeing someone who's in a position of relative authority standing up and saying, you know, it's okay to, to feel that way, it's okay, uh, you know, it's okay to talk about these issues uh, you know, in, a, in a public place. And I think that is, that is really important. Annie? Um, just on the back of Fulton's question and the discussions on mental health, we've spoken a lot about teacher training for inclusiveness and all the rest of it. But obviously, as well, it's like if there's a, as mental health issues there, teachers don't always are not always able to identify or deal with mm. or deal with the issues that are there. Um, and I think it's really important that it is very much if you go into a school and the head teacher is committed to delivering mm. inclusiveness, if they're committed to delivering mental health for their pupils, I went into a school in Glasgow. They have the peer-to-peer -peer work. They all wore hoodies, purple hoodies. Mm -hmm. The teachers wore purple lanyards, so you could go and speak to them about anything. But they had, the teacher made it her point to get mental health first aid training for her teachers mm -hmm. and the pupils. Now, if we can see it happening in some of the schools, in the school that you said you walked into and you felt it, why are we still talking about this? And why is the, some schools out there still not where they should be? Good question, Bill. I mean, if you think about I mean, a, a very important conversation in someone's professional journey as a teacher is when they're sitting talking to colleagues and managers about attainment. We all get that. One wonders what status is given to a conversation around health and well-being. To actually sit down and have, you know, give, you know, ha have a discourse around uh, health and well-being, and, and that having as much professional value as a conversation about attainment. And in that sense, the language of a society at large and its expectations are really important. You know, when people say, you know, something and attainment, that's fine. But, you know, health and well-being, you know, the health and well-being part of, of the curriculum for excellence has been there for some time and it's still to be, you know, it really is still to be fully developed. And I think there needs to be some sort of, and I'm not necessarily talking about in a monetary sense, but a professional reward for leaders who sit and talk about the health and well-being of everybody in the school. 
you know, that needs, yeah, exactly, and that needs to be unpacked. When you take the four capacities of the curriculum for excellence, it's applied to ev everybody in the school, through the Jani, the staff, the Waynes, everybody. Cara. I said including teachers, because yeah. yeah. there's higher rates of mental mm. health, mental ill health among teachers reported recently, with um, added pressures on teachers to cope with mm. uh, their work with less resources. And austerity, we haven't mentioned, but austerity is impacted on teachers' workload, but also on access to uh, mental health support for uh, pupils, but also mental health support for staff. Yeah, a healthy skill, Cara. What we know works is, is not necessarily one thing. So a whole school approach has to be around policies, teacher training, pupil engagement, but also leadership with that. Pupil engagement without leadership, I think, doesn't work. Um, but I completely agree with your point that actually, realistically, if we want teachers to be able to support young people effectively, we need to think about their well-being. Um, and it's one of the things that's come to my conclusion more recently. I talk a lot about the way in which LGBT young people experience poor mental health and, and the expectations I have of teachers, but I continually meet teachers who are under a lot of pressure. Um, so in order to address this issue, we actually need to think about how we're supporting teachers effectively as well. Okay, holistic approach. Ian. Yeah, to that, I think one of the concerns that uh, Christian Scotland has is the pressures on uh, education authority budgets and school budgets means that there is less um, support for children with additional support needs. Um, they, they may be getting the basic needs that they require in the classroom, but the other needs to be fully part of the school uh, may not be getting supported because of cuts that have been made to, um, to, to the, the additional support services. Um, I think one other thing I just want to touch on, because I appreciate we're running out of time, is um, it goes back to the culture thing, but the importance of, of language and how people talk about uh, issues is very important and we would like to see um, more effective disability equalities and disability awareness training in schools so that people are aware of the right language to use when referring to people with disability. Um, by for a start, not referring to the people with disability because they are disabled people. Um, they're disabled by what society uh, barriers there are. It may be physical, it may be emotional, it may be social. Um, so it's important that those things are recognised by teachers but also by pupils. Um, and that many people are not actually visibly disabled. They, their disability is not necessarily visible, um, but they may still have a condition which requires uh, to be taken into account. So we would like to see, um, working with disabled people themselves, how uh, developing better qual uh, disability equality and awareness training within schools. Great, great, great points. Mary. Thank you, um, convener. I had a, a brief direct question for um, Cara. I'm, I'm grateful for the, the written submission that you've provided us with um, this morning. And I just want to ask you, um, in, in your paper you talk about the supporting transgender young people in education, which you launched in November. And the, um, you, you go on to say that the guidance was endorsed by the Children's Commissioner and 17 local authorities. Is that the up-to-date figure? And if it is 17, why are the other 15 not signing up to this? Um, first of all, to give them their dues, we did ask them quite last minute whether or not they would like to sign up. And, and because we had existing relationships with 17 local authorities, they did it very quickly for us. Our second stage is in November to then do a call out to the rest of the local authorities in Scotland. Um, I mean, I would suspect that there will be more that come forward, but I doubt all, the, all of them will. We're, we're not a statutory body and we can't make local authorities do things, unfortunately, but we shall certainly try our very hardest. Um, so I expect more will come forward. But again, it comes back to the question of consistency. I suspect that there's certain local authorities that do lots of lots of work. Um, in, in terms of improving young people's health and well-being, and there's other local authorities that aren't consistently, and that is perhaps something that we need to look at. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Any other final points from colleagues? Alex. Thank you, Gamina. Yes, um, we've been talking a lot, and rightly so, about victims of bullying in school. Uh, but I've been reflecting about bullies themselves, because bullying behaviour can sometimes be a response to trauma within an individual themselves. Um, that it might be uh, attachment disorder, trauma or loss, that a young person is not knowing how to process these really toxic, powerful emotions, and it comes out in this, in this need to lash out. Um, do the panel agree that we need to instil within our uh, teaching staff an understanding of trauma so that they can work with uh, perpetrators of bullying from a trauma-informed perspective? Bill? Um, I think 
trauma. That is a, that's a, a, a good thing, a good way where we don't have the time to un, un, unpack that. I think it's, uh, I mean, what is traumatic is often, you know, the, 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 the young person is often struck dumb by the trauma. And it takes time to identify, you know, people think of trauma as something loud, as something visible. And there is an aspect of that that, that, that actually is very almost subterranean, deep sea, whatever, and, 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 and that creates real challenges. And it takes time to identify that and training to identify that. So it's a, and I'm sure that's what you're referring to, Alec, you know, in, in its various manifestations. But again, that comes back to being able to identify, to pick up the signs, because the signs of that trauma can sometimes be extraordinarily subtle. And it takes, you know, it takes sensitivity and training to, act, to actually pick up on that. Daniela. Boy, from that, I, I don't know if there's enough research on actually what um, um, bullies behaviour and if, uh, you know, they've been affected by trauma. Some have, some haven't. Um, but, I mean, in the case of the young people who are perpetrators sort of abusing case of xenophobia, you know, a lot of the language that they, um, you know, is the language of the hostile environment and immigration that they hear in the, you know, in the news and in the tabloid press and so on, uh, language they hear sometimes at home, anti-immigration, where it's like, you know, you uh, immigrants go home and so on. And uh, in a sense, that to me is, you know, the fact that this um, group of young people I'm working with, the EU nationals who are at risk just now and might become illegal if, in a sense, their status is not confirmed, will increase that. So in a sense, the perpetrators are, of uh, bullying in, in, in these situations are not always victims of trauma, but uh, replicate some of the, you know, hostile language that they hear, you know, commonly used in the environment. So I think we need to think about different uh, kind of, and almost taken on a case by case basis, and uh, maybe there is scope for some of them to look at, you know, the research on ACEs and adverse circumstances and how that might affect some of the bullies. But in other cases, they could come from um, very, um, you know, well established, uh, you know, families, communities, and so on, and just have very, um, you know, um, um, wrong views on um, uh, on people's status or disability or LGBT uh, status and so on. Yeah. Uh, just before I bring Katie in, I want you to have a wee think about, to, uh, you know, an idea to give us something that you would want us to, you know, focus in, in the work that we do on going. So if I give you a wee chance to think about that, uh, Katie, if you want to come in in, in response to that. Yeah, it was just um, in, in response to that. I mean, again, I think that this is a, a really um, important area that we absolutely need to be focusing on if we are really, um, you know, a, about changing behaviour and reducing bullying behaviour. We need to be addressing um, and supporting children who display that bullying behaviour. I do agree that it's a it's a case by case basis. You know, taking that really strong child centred approach approach um, and looking um, at what is going on for that child. There may be a number of reasons um, why that child is displaying um, this particular behaviour and one of them may be culture where they feel that actually within the culture of the setting that they're in that they, they need to act in this way so that actually they aren't bullied. Um, so uh, th there can be a, a number of different reasons but I, I do think that there is, um, you know, there has been a number of, of advances in our understanding and, and in our knowledge about how adverse childhood experiences, trauma, um, how all of these things can, can impact on children. And I think if we can be um, acknowledging and, and recognising and utilising that, that information as best we can, I think there's absolutely um, a place for that. And we know um, through inspection and through um, resources that, that Education Scotland have shown that um, there, there are effective ways or, or approaches um, to addressing bullying behaviour through nurturing approaches, through restorative solutions, um, solutions oriented approaches as well and um, so I think there's a lot to, to draw on and to learn from that and I think as well we need to remember that you know a lot of these areas are complex they do take a lot of time and um, teachers often don't feel that they do have that time and um, that to give that quality of support that is required so we do need to think about the other types of support and professionals um, and practitioners that could be feeding into this to, to create that whole school approach and really have those positive outcomes. 
Thanks, Katie. So just very, very finally, because we're almost out of time. Bill, if you had one, th one thing to tell us to take away to focus on, what would it be? Continue what you're doing. I mean, this, uh, this discourse uh, is the sort of thing we do with our equality reps. I mean, literally, the quality of this discourse and the range of the discourse is what we try and replicate with our equality reps. It's as it's it's literal as that. Thanks. Carol? Definitely, I would agree with Bill that um, it would be really valuable if the committee do continue to look at this issue, perhaps revisit it in future and, and see after a slightly longer period where the progress has gone. I think you'll have seen from the written submission that we put in that we are aware of progress in some areas, um, but I think the, ref the reflections around the table today um, and our own experience certainly suggests that there's a lot of work to be done in improving the capacity of schools and teachers to take preventative and reactive measures against bullying and particularly against specific forms of prejudice based bullying and having an understanding of that um, and there are real resource implications for that that won't be easy to get around um, I think continuing to study and try and understand what the barriers are and to gather that good practice and find out how it can be rolled out is going to be um, really important because our main concern at the end of the day is the experience of children in schools um, and while we have some really great stuff happening it's not good enough that that's not the experience for all of the children thank you <coughs> Catherine I just thank you for inviting me because this is my first committee so and it's been really positive experience actually just to see how much um, passion there is for, for these issues. There is seemingly a lot more work to be done, but I think what I've taken away is that it's, you know, the kind of the ethos of the school, the kind of the, the wider focus in terms of not only the whole school approach, but also involving communities is a really a, a good way forward. So some of the work I do is looking at how politics or geopolitics affects people's everyday lives and encounters with others. So actually building healthy relationships from a really early age and how people relate, how we value each other is so important. And also not losing sight of the wider political context and how like Daniela was saying, the narrative around migration and, and, and otherness is does affect and validate people's everyday kind of the verbal language that people use and, and young people use. And, and so we have to be really careful about that. Yeah, thank you. And I'm glad you've enjoyed your first visit to, to committee. Let's hope it's not your last. <laughs> Daniela. I would echo Kate's comments around being um, part of the group and I found it an enjoyable experience, so thank you for that. Um, two things uh, for me, one is around young people's voice and we, I think we need to do more of that. Of, um, you know, that's what surprised me in my research is how many of them spend time to share their experiences of buildings so, which are deeply personal and you know, most of them we haven't met face to face and they <coughs> spend so much time to explain and uh, outline the experiences uh, of um, racism and xenophobia. So I think we need to find ways of bringing young people into the debates that are going on and the work, the great work that you know this committee and others um, and the government is, is doing on this. Um, and the second dimension of that is around, um, you know, continuing to work with teachers and find better ways of supporting teachers who are doing a lot of good work in very difficult circumstances and they have all the vast majority of teachers meanwhile want to do the best um, they can for um, the, their, their schools and their children but they don't find the language or they don't have the skills and we really need to support them in that uh, difficult job that um, is becoming more difficult I guess in recent times so and I Thank hope you'll come back to committee too, uh, Daniela. Carolyn. Um, two, very quickly. Um, the first is that, that t we can take gender, could we please take gender forward and truly embed it in all aspects of policy um, here, particularly around bullying. I think gender is often forgotten, but we're 51% of the population and we are still hearing from girls who say that they find corridors in schools that they are unable to go down. So that is still completely unacceptable. So that would be my first. And my second would be again to plead that there are, with your education colleagues, that young people are really involved in creating policies, echoing what you've said. There are young people here who are shouting out to be listened to, to be part of these policy making, particularly around PSHE. They have strong views and they want to be in that. They want to tell you what's right. And I don't feel that they're being listened to at the moment. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, there was a, one strange bit within the uh, 
the, the uh, guidance on respect for all on page 18 about um, quality impact assessments, where it says policies that address bullying based on protected characteristics will, where appropriate, require completion of an impact assessment. Uh, I would have thought that all the policies um, can have an impact on the qualities and therefore should all be subject to quality impact assessments. So I'm a bit weird, strange about that. But related to that is the key thing about this is how we actually get this national policy to ensure that it trickles down to all schools and how we monitor that and how it's implemented into schools. So I think that's the key thing next as to how we actually see how this actually works in terms of improving practice within schools and the impact it has on addressing prejudice-based bullying. I'd be interested in the other piece of work this committee is doing on human rights in this parliament, becoming that human rights guarantor, and that includes human rights impact assessments on policies. So you may be interested in that other joint piece of work that we're doing now. Cara. Well, on human rights, um, I've got an ask which is around incorporating the UNCRC into Scots law. Um, I believe if we can get children's rights right in Scotland, this would make a massive difference in terms of prejudice-based bullying. In the areas where, uh, where we have to intervene or advocate on behalf of LGBT young people, it's because their rights have not been realised, they have been ignored. So young people, are their privacy is ignored, they're outed to people when they shouldn't be. Um, but importantly, they're not listened to. And, and a lot of the time I spend engaging with teachers, I ask them to think about, have they, have they asked the young person what they want to happen? And that's when they get it right. So that would be my biggest ask. Okay. Katie. Well, I would echo all of those um, suggestions that have already been made, but I suppose in terms of the work of your committee, it would just be a plea to um, to really consider children and young people across all of your business. I think sometimes we, we silo adults' issues um, and children young people's issues, and we forget that there are huge opportunities for early intervention and, and learning when we actually think about how those issues like um, sexual wider sexual harassment, hate crime, um, more widely, human rights more widely, um, how actually we should be ensuring those messages are, are filtering down to children and young people as well. Thank you. Mary? Well, certainly I think it's commendable that this organisation, this, this committee, puts such a clear focus on such an important issue. And my plea also is that in terms of you provide that overview and all the protected characteristics. And my plea probably is, although it legally isn't one, could we include poverty? Because there's nothing in legislation that stops us adding extras, because I feel that would help to close the circle. Partly listening to Bill and all the work that goes on in promoting health and wellbeing that sits in the Scottish Attainment Challenge, I feel that might be a very interesting aspect of work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I give uh, a, a very grateful thanks to all of your participation this morning. You will be interested to know that we will have a Cabinet Secretary in front of us, uh, probably uh, in uh, autumn, uh, in order to get a fuller update from Government on where we're at with this. Um, this is an ongoing piece of work. This committee committed to doing any of its work over the next Three, three years, but over the whole five years piece, we would build in report back mechanisms. So we will be doing this on a regular basis in order to track some of that progress, in order to learn from you, and in order to make that change that we all want to see. So thank you so much for your written evidence, your oral evidence. And if you go away, my usual plea, if you've forgotten to tell us something, please let us know, and we're really keen to hear from you and any ideas or resolutions that you have. So thank you so much. And I'm going to suspend now to go into private. <laughs>